Bonjour tout le monde. Euh, je vais commencer euh, en français pour vous dire à quel point on est content d'être ici euh, ce matin. C'est une occasion de célébrer le travail d'équipe que l'on voit euh, derrière moi. Je vais commencer par souligner la présence de l'équipe euh, de Anita Vandenberg, qui est la députée fédérale d'Ottawa West Nippeyun. Et derrière moi, il y a Dr. Etches, que tout le monde connaît, je crois, qui est la, 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 la responsable de la santé publique ici à Ottawa qui, avec son équipe, fait de très grandes choses depuis le début de la COVID-19. Il des choses qui sont connues et qui influencent et qui inspirent beaucoup d'autres santé publique à l'échelle du pays. Et il y a aussi le docteur De Villa, qui est, euh, qui est la responsable de la santé publique, cette fois-ci à Toronto. Alors, docteur De Villa et docteur HS travaillent évidemment beaucoup ensemble. So, I'll be very brief because you see all the excitement around and all the, the great things that are happening in this particular community, it's absolutely essential that people speak about vaccination. Vaccination is something that has made a huge difference in COVID-19, and we know it is particularly valuable right now, as our children are suffering for all, from all sorts of respiratory viruses, our pediatric, pediatric hospitals are overwhelmed, our healthcare workers are very tired, our families are also struggling. So now is the time to get vaccinated and to be protected, you know, individually, but also in a family and in a work uh, environment, especially with the fall. It is, uh, you know, it is going to be uh, increasingly difficult. Christmas is coming too, so we want to be safer in our family environment. And the winter will also be very, very key. So now is the right time to do that. And for more, I'll turn to Dr. H.S. Thank you, Minister, and uh, merci beaucoup. Uh, C'est tellement important uh, de concentrer sur les bénéfices de la vaccination pour les enfants. Uh, Aujourd'hui, on discute bien sûr la COVID-19 et la grippe, mais il y a d'autres vaccins que les enfants manquent aux causes de la pandémie. Uh, contre la rougeole, la polio. Alors, c'est important de, de partager l'information qu'il y a des cliniques de santé publique, il y a les médecins familles qui peuvent aider uh, à augmenter la, la protection contre les maladies infectieuses avec la vaccination. Et c'est le temps maintenant. So in English, I wanted to, to emphasize we are talking a lot about COVID-19 and influenza and the importance of vaccination to protect people, um, uh, to keep people out of hospital, uh, to help our health system function. And for children especially, we know that some are missing the protection of childhood vaccines, so for measles, for polio. And so again, now is the time to reach out uh, to your public health units, your family doctors, uh, to just make sure that, that you're not missing those protections for, that come from vaccination in childhood. We know that vaccines work, they're safe, and they save lives. Thank you. Dr. So thank you very much, Dr. Etches and Monsieur le Ministre. It is a great pleasure to be visiting here in Ottawa uh, today. I'm Dr. Eileen de Villa, the Medical Officer of Health for the City of Toronto. Hard to add much more to the excellent comments already made by Minister Duclos and by my colleague Dr. Etches. I would say this, I suppose the one thing I can add is whether you're in Ottawa, Toronto or any other part of the province, we know that it has been a challenging fall thus far and we're anticipating more challenge in respect of viral respiratory illnesses, notably RSV and influenza. As Dr. Etches pointed out, we have safe and effective vaccines available to protect our children and to protect our entire communities and, of course, to protect our health care system so that it's able to provide necessary services to all, young and old alike, whether it's in respect of illness related to viral respiratory disease or for any other reason. So please do take advantage of these wonderful clinics that are available. I thank my colleagues at Ottawa Public Health for their service. But there are many other vaccination partners all around the province do seek out these vaccines. They protect uh, you, they protect our community, and they do indeed save lives. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. We'll now move to the uh, Q&A question. We'll move to the La Belle des Questions. I'm going to one question, one follow-up, a question and a follow-up. 
Um, and please keep your question brief. I'll ask uh, the minister and like the doctors to keep their answer brief also. Uh, and if you can say your media, um, your name, and also who your question is uh, for, they'll be really appreciated. So we'll start with Jeff. Any question? Yeah. Oop. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm uh, Andrew Duffy from the Ottawa Citizen. Can you help us understand why you think vaccination rates for COVID-19 among children is so low? Can we get you to move up to the mic, please? Right in front of that black one, please. Sorry, thank you. So what we see with COVID-19 vaccination is that the uptake has actually been very high across all ages, uh, even 5 to 11-year-olds, uh, you know, good rates of uptake. It's really the youngest population where the vaccine was most recently approved that we see some lower rates of vaccine, and it's really... Uh, meaning that children are missing out on the protection from a vaccine that's safe and that has been shown to decrease transmission and decrease serious illness. So I, I think that is the message uh, that this vaccine is available, uh, that it's useful and that it's still needed at this time. We still have COVID in our community and with all the different viruses adding up, RSV and flu, you know, everything we do to prevent transmission with vaccination, with wearing masks indoors, it, it makes a difference. Uh, okay. Uh, le, le niveau de vaccination contre la COVID-19 est le plus haut pour les populations pl le plus âgées, mais euh, pour les enfants aussi, euh, c'est clair que le vaccin contre la COVID-19, ça aide de diminuer la transmission de COVID-19 et aussi d'augmenter euh, la protection contre la hospitalisation. Alors, euh, c'est disponible, euh, c'est encore important. COVID-19 est dans notre communauté encore et c'est disponible maintenant. So for those who didn't hear the question, it was in respect of the decriminalization application that Toronto is making to our federal partners. Uh, so this is, in fact, a, a policy that we're pursuing, a policy change that we're pursuing. And uh, we are actively working with a group, uh, a reference group within our community to ensure that the model that we're proposing makes sense for Toronto. Certainly very heartened to hear of the work that is happening in BC and learning a lot from their experience. But I would say that at this point in time, we are working through the details for what makes sense for a made in Toronto solution that is uh, cognizant and takes into consideration our unique circumstances which can learn a lot from BC, but are in fact quite different. So um, I might have missed it with all the noise, sorry. I, I will ask a follow-up question. What are the specific issues that you're having? Uh, so there aren't specific issues. It's just a question of working through with our partners to make sure that the model that we're putting forward makes sense for Toronto. Next question. For uh, Madame Hatches, uh, en lien avec le port du masque dans les écoles, on a le Ottawa Carlton School Board qui a eu un débat sur la question. Est-ce que le port du masque devrait être obligatoire dans les écoles à Ottawa? Uh, et si vous pouvez répondre en français et en anglais. Okay. Uh, le port du masque est important partout à Ottawa, uh, dans les espaces publics à l'intérieur. Uh, c'est clair que le masque fonctionne bien de diminuer la transmission de la COVID-19 et c'est mon forte recommandation maintenant que partout à Ottawa, on porte le masque à l'intérieur. Et c'est un niveau de protection. Il y a aussi la vaccination qui est important uh, de uh, rester chez eux quand on est malade. Uh, chaque uh, action peut aider de, de gérer la situation et prévenir les maladies. So, um, I'm saying that uh, right now we have a lot of respiratory illness in our community. It's not just COVID, it's influenza, it's RSV. And so my strong recommendation is that everywhere in Ottawa, when you're in indoor space, 
you know, that is the time to be wearing masks. Now it is the time to pick up that practice. We've practiced it for a couple of years. Now is the time to do it again. And it's one layer of protection. We also have vaccination uh, that's available for people for COVID and then the flu. And we know staying home when you're sick is really important. Again, having that flexibility from employers to support their employees to stay home when they're sick. Et là-dessus, parce que ça crée certaines divisions, euh, le débat en cause, celui qu'on a vu à Ottawa Carlton, ça crée des divisions. Est-ce qu'il ne serait pas préférable, parce que les divisions scolaires ont pas le pouvoir de statuer, c'est vous qui, qui le faites, est-ce qu'il ne serait pas préférable pour vous de dire c'est obligatoire ou ça ne l'est pas, plutôt que de faire une propre recommandation? Euh... La situation avec la pression sur notre système de santé, c'est partout la province. Et les solutions pour euh, augmenter le, le nombre de personnes qui portent les masques, c'est avec l'information, euh, avec euh, la vie. Et si on arrive à la point où c'est important d'avoir quelque chose d'obligatoire, ça c'est une action pour la province, euh, d'aider toute la province de gérer la situation. Okay. So the, this, this high level of respiratory illness all together with COVID and influenza and RSV, it's, it's something that's affecting our whole province at this time. And so, you know, we, we're all working hard at the local and provincial level to help people understand that wearing masks now indoors is an important action. If we were to get to a place where it needed to be more of a requirement, then that really is an action that we're looking for at the provincial level to help the whole system across the province. Hi, Minister. You mentioned hired healthcare workers in your opening statements, and the healthcare workers were very disappointed to see the demise of the CHT districts. Just curious, what comes next? Are you planning, like, are there any plans to include another large discussion among all the provincial health ministers with yourself and uh, Professor Bennett, or are you seeking one on one meetings? That's a great question. Uh, there are two levels of discussion. The first one, the Prime Minister is leading, and he has already uh, signal, and it has asked me to say that explicitly, that there will be more funding through an increase in the CHD and through bilateral targeted funding, targeted on the priorities of provinces and territories. So he has said that already. That's at the level of the Prime Minister and the Premiers. My level is uh, with the health ministers. And the good news is that with health ministers, we agree on both on the diagnostics that we are uh, seeing across Canada when it comes to our health care system, which is currently in a crisis, and that's because we have, we're having a health workers crisis, but also agree on the solutions to that, to that crisis. So our relationship is very strong and is very positive, and I'm continuing that relationship almost every day. Yesterday I spoke again to a couple of my, my health minister's colleagues. We have had 11 meetings uh, since uh, last year plus the one in Vancouver two years, uh, two, uh, two, two weeks ago. And we're going to have these, these discussions very regularly because we want to add to the support that the federal government has already provided so that we can give greater access to family health uh, teams, we can reduce the time, the time it takes to have access to a, a cancer surgery or diagnostic. We can provide more and timely mental health services. And we can make our system data system in Canada, a modern system. And, uh, and that means you know, helping uh, share information across pharmacists, uh, across physicians, nurses, uh, lab technicians. We want to, people to have access to their electronic medical records. Like here, if you look behind, behind me, you know, people are entering the information on vaccination status so that this, that information is shared with, say, physicians and, and hospital workers. That's not, unfortunately, a very common thing that we see in Canada nowadays. Data saves lives, so we also want to uh, uh, support uh, colleagues across Canada in making our system more modern. And I'm going to follow up, and I'm sorry, it is a little hard to hear. So it's hard to say, call that. After what you said about the first I level. can take that now. Okay. Way too. Um, you did say there's two levels, and the first level seems to be if I understood correctly, the premiers and the prime minister, and the second level is yourself and the other health ministers, correct? So when you say there's the first level and those conversations will happen, are there plans for, you know, a big, uh, the word escapes me, but basically one of those big meetings 
with between the Prime Minister and the Premiers about the siege to Sisplay? The Prime Minister has, me, has asked me to do two things. First, to make it clear to my colleagues, health ministers, that there will be more support to provinces and territories through an increase in the CHD and a special fund targeted to the priorities of provinces and territories when it comes to, for instance, increasing access to family doctors and reducing backlogs in surgeries. The second thing the Prime Minister has asked me is to make all health ministers agree on priorities. What do we want to do with that additional support? That work needs to be done at the table of health ministers. It can't be only a, a request by premiers to send unconditional transfers to their finance ministers. It has to be set in a manner that is supportive of the work of my colleagues, health ministers, and that requires speaking about results. We did that in Vancouver. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't come to the type of uh, open and forward-looking agenda that we were all aligned to get to, but that just means that we have a bit more work to do. Bien sûr. Donc, ce que le Premier ministre m'a demandé de faire depuis plusieurs mois, et ce que j'ai fait à la conférence de Vancouver il y a environ deux semaines, c'est un, de dire à mes collègues ministres de la Santé qu'il va y avoir d'autres appuis additionnels du gouvernement canadien, en plus de tout ce qu'on fait déjà depuis plusieurs mois. Donc, cet appui va venir par une augmentation du transfert canadien en santé si on modernise notre système de, de données euh, au Canada et par un, un, un fonds additionnel pour appuyer les priorités des ministres de la Santé à travers le, le pays. La deuxième chose que le premier ministre m'a demandé de faire, c'est d'arriver avec mes collègues ministres de la Santé à un constat sur les priorités que l'on veut appuyer ensemble. La bonne nouvelle, c'est que tous mes collègues ministres de la Santé et moi-même, on s'entend sur ces priorités. On aurait aimé les annoncer il y a deux semaines à Vancouver. Malheureusement, on n'a pas pu le faire parce que les premiers ministres nous ont demandé de ne parler que d'argent. Mais ça, parler que d'argent, ce n'est pas notre rôle au ministre de la Santé. Il faut parler aussi de la façon d'utiliser cet argent. Donc, le travail se continue. Euh, à nouveau, j'ai eu des conversations cette semaine avec des ministres particuliers. On espère le trouver d'autres moyens au cours des prochaines semaines de continuer à faire ce travail de manière encore plus visible.